Scope's an important concept, so we're going to start by looking at some basic examples of what we mean, where variables can be, where they can't be. Then we're going to look at some more specific categories like locals and globals and the system globals and then how we can make our own globals and what a global even means. Then we're going to talk about namespaces. I think of these as big long lists of variables we have access to. So we're going to talk about how you can actually find out what these are. How can you output the variables that you have in your namespace? And then also talk about the order that your code is actually written in. It's another important thing that decides what you have access to at what time. So at certain states, you don't have the same namespace as you do at other states. As you write code and move your way down a page, there's changes in the namespace along the way that you have to take account for. And then finally, we're going to talk about privacy. Now this relates to classes, so it's a little bit premature for what we're talking about, but I want to start implanting the idea that there's also what you could think of as as a system of permissions. So let's talk scope. Scope's an important concept because it's really about what's in the area. I almost think of it in real life like something that would be geofenced in or different rooms inside of a building, something like that. So for the example, I tried to make it kind of in the same way. And I want you to first imagine a kitchen. Now say you had one pie that was sitting on the counter and we're gonna call that pie global rhubarb. And then inside the fridge, there's another pie from the night before, and that's called local apple. Now you can really think of the two pies in a real world sense as being separated by the fridge. Let's say that one area is the kitchen counter and one area is inside of the refrigerator, and they are separated by that fridge door. Someone would need to open the door and actually put one of the pies in or take one of the pies out if you wanted to get past that boundary. So the concept of scope is like asking what pies are here on the counter right now and then what pies are in the fridge. But we can only, but we can think of those as separate namespaces. We have a variable called pie and we also have a variable called pie. So if these were written right next to each other, we know that one would override the other when the next line came. We know first this variable would be assigned this string and then later it would be overwritten and then assign this string next. But because it's inside of this refrigerator function, it's protected. Until it's called, that's not going to do anything. So just take a second to think about what's going on here. Pi is defined and pi is about to be redefined in here. So if this function changes it, then pi is going to be apple underneath. But if it doesn't change it, it's going to be global rhubarb underneath. Okay, so let's run this in a second, but let's talk global and local scope. So the way I talked before about the fridge being its own area, that would be a local scope of the fridge, and the counter would be the local scope of the counter. But when you say something is a global, what you're saying is it can be everywhere. Whether I'm in the fridge or on the counter, I have access to some super pie, like some lemon... A lemon meringue pie, let's make it, that's floating near the ceiling and is just everywhere. It just follows me around. So when I'm in the kitchen, it's there. And this, like, floating, kind of like, I think of it kind of like a drone, like a floating lemon meringue pie that's on a, you know, drone that flies around with me. And whether I'm at the fridge or I'm at the counter, that lemon meringue pie is always within scooping distance of my spoon. So let's look at an example of what I mean. And now when we print out bake, what do you think is going to happen? Because this is returning the local scope of pie. Okay, we get local apple. Seems reasonable. It defined this thing inside. Even though pi was defined before, it overwrote it, and then it returned it into our bake variable here. And then when I go to look at pi, do you think that's been overwritten? Because it was overwritten inside when we executed this function. Nope, global rhubarb. So it stayed on the outside. It's almost like it was like this lemon ring pie was floating out here, but then when I was looking inside of the fridge, I like pulled it in and then replaced it with an apple pie and then ate the apple pie, but it was a clone. Like the other one's still floating up there, still remembering it's a meringue pie and it's going to follow me to the next place. Man, I sometimes I, I blow my own mind with how good I am at metaphors. Now let's look at system globals. Maybe another way to think about this would be reserved keywords, but these are the ultra global namespaces. These are like just by entering the house, whether you're in the kitchen or you have your drone marine pie next to you or any of that stuff, you can't change it. So T-R-U-E, I can never make this a variable. I can never change it in any way. I will just get errors when I try to do something like that. So whenever we take a system global like true and we put it into a variable, we do make a copy of it, but we can never actually change true. It could never go the other way. But regular globals are usually defined with capitals. Now, it's important to remember that when we write a variable in all caps, what we're signaling to other programmers 
is that this is a global that you should set the parameter on or that we really don't want you to mess with. It doesn't mean that they can't, it doesn't make it immutable, it's just still a regular variable, but there usually is something specific that the programmer's trying to bring your eye to, trying to bring attention to. We've assigned it the variable pink, this car color, and now we're gonna try to change it with a function. So we have a new car color, which is the exact same variable. What color is inside? Blue and pink. Just like we did before, it's exactly what we expected. This new color took its cue from the inside of the function. But now let's look at it again. And this time, let's use this keyword global. So now imagine that we take the exact same code where we're assigning a car color pink on the outside of the function, and then inside we're making a car color blue, and then we're returning that car color. But we're adding the global keyword to car color first. What we're saying is, hey, this thing is now global. Now global meaning break the heck out of this fridge. I, I know you were an apple pie that was inside the refrigerator, but now I've strapped you to a drone so you can follow me around and you can get out of here too. So what do you think is going to happen when we try to change this one? Well, first off, we get this syntax warning. Now I was playing with this before recording and I'm going to leave this syntax warning here. I do think this is a this is not really how you would write a normal function that you were using global in, but for our example, when I'm trying to show the overwriting, I'm going to leave it that way. So what's going to happen when we run this? Okay, blue, that makes sense. It took its cue from the inside. Car color overwrote it. Then we made it a global, and then we returned it. But here's the powerful part. Because car color here was defined as a global, even though it was returned inside of this variable, it also was able to break out and override pink up here, which was defined inside here, which should be confined to the inside of this refrigerator. Rhubarb is now Apple, people. The world is upside down. Global gave it so much power that it broke out of the refrigerator by itself and put itself on the counter and replaced the pie on the counter. Now we have an apple pie inside and outside. Pretty wild. So you can see why this global keyword can be a powerful thing. It can allow us to define something in a local space that can break out of that local space. So now let's talk about namespaces. Now the way we were talking before about the pie being on the counter or in the fridge, that was something where you would look around and just see which pies are there. But when we're talking about programming, we don't have a physical world, a counter that we can look at. So namespaces are the equivalent. So imagine we're in the living room watching the football game and we ask our you know, wife or husband or girlfriend or whatever, honey, I am curious what pies are in the refrigerator and what pies are on the counter right now. So she comes back with a list. She says, okay, on this post-it note, I've listed all of the pies that are on the counter. And then on this post-it note, I've listed all of the pies that are in the refrigerator. And then you look over and you're like, okay, on the counter, there's apple and uh, pineapple and um, cheesecake. And then in the fridge, there's, uh, you know, apple and, and others. So... The namespaces are those post-it notes with all of the lists on it. Because we don't actually have that physical space, we can look at that. So how do we output one of these lists? So first off, I just want to import this module P print. It stands for pretty print, and it has nothing to do with namespaces or scopes. But when you print out a dictionary, it does a nice job of indenting them when you print out to console. So it's just an aesthetic thing. And this function would work just fine without. Just to prove it to you, I'll show. But it's a little bit ugly for an output. So when we wrap it in this nice function, pprint, then we get it in a more indented way with this nice scroller. So that's the only reason we have that there. So don't get confused on that. Anyways, but here in our local, you can see that we have the variable car color and its value right now. We can think of these as key values or we're going to give these as variables in their current state. Be This is the container and inside of it is the color blue, which is weird. Or inside of this cucumber, there is the value of truth. You know, that's the thing, and that's the thing about the core of a cucumber, is that they are true. They are, they are true blues, actually. Cucumbers are true blue inside. These are the variables we have access to. So now remember, inside of our fridge, our local space is defined much more narrowly. Out here, when we're just running it, it's saying, all right, my local space is pretty much my global space. I'm not inside any containers. If we're both, you know, if we're both in a house that has no refrigerators and all the pies are out in the main area, then the global and local space will be the same. But you can see once I put the local function inside of my own function, pi is being assigned to the string pecan. Then you see when I run this fridge function, there's only one thing that comes up, just this pi. In fact, if I get rid of that, there's nothing. Just an empty dictionary that has no variables. It's a refrigerator with no pies inside of it, which is a really sad thing. 
But no matter where we are, inside or outside, if we use globals, we get every variable that's available to us anywhere. So here's global ran by itself. And now you can see, even if we call our global function from inside of our refrigerator, we will get everything. It's a good way to put that is like the apple pie that's in the refrigerator is not something the guests know about until they open the fridge. So basically inside of the fridge, we have access to the globals, but the globals don't go the other way and have access back. And that Python has built in these global and local functions that you can use. Code, there are some amazing magics we can use. For example, percent who is going to show you all of your global variables. So you can see that a warm pie showed up and our pie from before and even pprint. It is in the namespace because it's in a, its own object, its own name. And then cucumber from before and car color. So you can see this is the way in reality to do it. It's just open up a new cell and put percent. Now that we know about these powerful magics for clearing out our namespaces, I want to show you in a real world application why you would want to think about using these and how going down the page in a linear order from top to bottom and left to right is actually something that does come up. You need to really think about what's happened before and after certain points to reset. So yes, we'd like to reset everything. So looking at it, we know that our namespace is empty. There is no variables that have been defined, no names that have been defined. So if I want to find out what the cosine of 90 is, and I haven't brought in the math package or module, to, you can see that nothing is going to run. Makes sense, right? We haven't defined what math is. So that makes sense because the namespace is empty. But after we do import it, so now I've imported it, let's look at our namespace. So we have brought in math, and the only thing that we're seeing in our namespace is math. So now that I have access to math, I know that I can do math.cosine, and we can assign it to our variable, which should be a second name. And now you'll see that we have both. And also, whenever we see something here in namespace, it's also a trigger that we can probably find some methods. So if we do math dot and then tab, remember in Jupyter, it shows us all of the things we can do with it. Or if we went over here to even our variable that we made and did the same thing, we can actually see why the point would be. Like you try to run something, you don't see it, you check the namespace, using this percent who in Jupyter, it shows you what you have access to, what names you have access to, and then that kind of starts getting you thinking about how these tools can work together. It's like, think of if you're like a mechanic and you're like working on a car and you like scan around to see like what's close to me, a screwdriver, a wrench, maybe I can use one of these tools. So it's just about scanning the area for what's available. Finally, let's talk privacy. Now, if you are going through this course in the passes, like we talked about earlier, you probably have seen classes. But if you're just sort of following these in a linear order, you probably haven't. Classes are going to be an important thing that we learn later. But for now, you can think of them as souped up functions. And it's really the only place you're going to find variables that have different permissions, like privacy, on them. But let's go ahead and just get our head around them, because we are talking about scope right now. And the scope of a variable or name is going to be where it's located, like on the counter or in the fridge. What we're now saying is that, like, if you look inside the fridge and you see an apple pie, you're like, sweet, I have access to it. It's in my namespace. But then you go to pick it up and there's a little note on it that says, like, this is Beth's pie, don't eat it or you're dead. And you're like, dang. So even though I can see it and I have access to the pie, I'm in my you know, office refrigerator or whatever, and it's actually somebody else's and I can't eat it or they're going to be mad at me. So that's what this is about. This is about taking a name and saying, hey, don't mess with it because it's got some other use. So if you see a name that has a single underscore like this one, underscore Sherlock Holmes, then you know that it's probably supposed to stay private. And just like in the office, you like could eat somebody else's pie that they left in the fridge. You really shouldn't. And that's exactly how an underscore should be thought of is that somebody made it. Another programmer wrote it and said, hey, don't touch this. This is private. It's mine. I don't want to mess with for whatever reason, although you could. It's not really locked off or anything. It's just, it's sort of like suggested. Like, hey, like we're all in an office here. I'm writing code. You're writing code. Don't mess with it because I put an underscore there. I want it to stay private. And then double underscore private is a little bit different. So this is especially when we're dealing with a class, something you're going to see that is important. When there is a double underscore or a dunder, as it's sometimes called, then you're referring to something called name mangling, and you really can't mess with this pie. Like, this is the kind of pie that if you eat it, the fridge might not even work anymore, and you're going to break 
the whole refrigerator. Don't, if you see a double underscore, change it because what's happening is Python is actually looking for these double underscores and then it's changing it in classes so it has the class name in front of it. It's almost like an important utility function that when you're using classes, which are like blueprints for objects, when it's making the objects, it's going to need to see that that's a private variable or a private function so that it can overwrite it. So it might, might not make tons of sense if you haven't learned about classes yet, but the important thing is just to remember that anytime you see this double underscore, think to yourself, ooh, that should probably be behind the scenes or hidden, or I shouldn't be messing with it. That's like going to Disneyland and looking like over the gate. Like, that's not for the guests, you know? That's the double underscore. And this one's like, hey, don't mess with me. Like, I got my headphones in, you know, I know you could, like, if you need to, like, make eye contact and I'll take my earphones out. But really, just, I'm trying to work right now. All right, so you learned a ton today. We're getting pretty, pretty advanced here. You guys are really starting to learn a lot about programming. So I will see you in the next lesson. Subscribe to the New Monic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.